Hi, uh, I'm Tom Ravenscroft, the editor of the zine, and welcome to a talk with Brewer Happel called The Case for Equitable Spaces. We'll be exploring social value, value in the built environment and the role that context and policy plays in the design process, particularly in the UK, USA, and across Asia. Uh, joining me for this discussion today is Brewer Happel's associate principal, Heidi Creighton, Bartlett's associate press professor, Dr. Priti Parikh, and cultural thinker and advisor, Dr. Anna Marizuela Kim. So, hi. Heidi, pretty Anna, um, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's great you can all make us make it, and I hope we have an interesting conversation um, that everyone learns something. I'm ho hoping to learn a lot. So first of all, we're going to kick off with Heidi. Uh, Heidi, do you want to uh, introduce yourself again? Uh, say who you are, what you do, and then start with your presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Um, again, my name is Heidi Creighton. I'm an associate principal at Bureau Happold. I'm based in Los Angeles, and I lead the sustainability group here for the West Coast. And just so thrilled to be here with all of you today to talk about this really important topic. So with that, let me just get my slides going. Great. Okay. Um, so just to start off, we have a really critical question to ask ourselves, which is who is really paying the price for climate change? And, and the answer is those with the least amount of resources to combat it, right? Climate change, flooding, heat, wildfires, pandemics, and other shocks and stressors are really disproportionately impacting historically marginalized communities. And communities of color are more vulnerable and at greater risk and thus resilient to be able to bounce back from these events. Um, there are many things that we can do in the AEC industry to address these inequities, uh, which primarily revol revolves around de decarbonizing our building stock, but also raising up the voices of those that aren't typically involved in the decision-making process. So we have a really important opportunity or, or Really even a duty to make the case for human-centered design. The average American spends more than 90% of their time indoors and the impact of the built environment on our sleep, on our cognitive function, even on our life expectancy is really profound. Um, and we're currently living through a climate and biodiversity crisis compounded by a pandemic. Uh, pretty unique situation we're in right now. So we really need to advocate for policies and regulations that mitigate the consequences of climate change and really increase resiliency and equity to protect those who are most at risk. So um, building sector decarbonization policies have lots of great potential. They can reduce energy costs for communities. They can drive equitable economic prosperity, right? They can address population displacement and reduce exposure to health risks and also really empower communities to participate in the planning process. And since 2009 here in California, we've had the Cal Green Code which was the first statewide green building code in the US. And today the state of California and cities and counties up and down the state are working towards decarbonizing the building stock for both new buildings and existing buildings. Um, and that's really focused around electrification and embodied carbon. Um, some really great announcements uh, just this past Monday from the mayor of Los Angeles. Um, he announced that LA will be the first city in the nation to commit to a carbon-free grid by 2035. And that really is underpinned and prioritized by equity um, to maintain energy reliability and affordability. Um, he also put a moratorium on any new oil and gas drilling um, in the city. He's dedicated $1 billion, yes, billion to ending houselessness um, and yes, we do need that kind of funding here. It's, it's, it's a major issue. Um, and then also uh, committed to invest $151 million in programs and pilots that are centered around racial justice. Um, so the images in this presentation represent two projects that I've worked on that are centered around equity. Um, the R County project is the first countywide sustainability plan for the county of LA and included a series of 11 participatory workshops. Um, the ambitious plan put social equity really at the core to address historic, systematic, and even institutionalized policies that we've created um, that have disproportionate pollution impacts on low-income 
and communities of color. So we developed a really innovative approach to the stakeholder engagement um, for organizations representing public, private, and nonprofit sectors. But we also um, engaged with and compensated um, community-based organizations in each of the five county supervisor districts. So those organizations played a really key role in uplifting equity discussions, both by participating in the design and the facilitation of these workshops, um, but also too, to ensure that this, the discussions were inclusive of the perspectives of these low income communities. And um, it was really wonderful. At the start of each workshop, the county chief sustainability officer began each one with a land acknowledgement. And it was a really poignant way to start each workshop by honoring the land of the native populations. Um, and as the most populous county in the U.S., L.A. County is actually home to one in 33 Americans uh, whose lives will be improved by this plan, and, and that includes me and my family. Um, and then finally, um, this is an image of Santa Monica City Hall East. It's a 50,000 square foot building, which is pursuing full living building challenge certification. Um, and this rating system really embraces biodiversity and humanity. Uh, the tool addresses many things, but it includes human-scaled living that's really focused on creating walkable and pedestrian-oriented communities. Um, biophilic design is a core tenant that really connects um, building occupants with nature. They require that you grow food on site for healthy local food to really address community needs. Um, and it, there's, there's other strategies around beauty and equity um, in this rating system as well. And by working to achieve LBC, the team vetted over 1,000 products to eliminate toxic red list chemicals. And lots of great outcomes there. It improves the health outcomes, not just for the building occupants, but also for the manufacturing workers, the construction workers, the fence line communities, the first responders, everyone who's impacted by our material choices. Um, and the architecture, engineering, and the construction um, practices behind this project really considered not only the environment, but also climate change and the human health aspects as well. Um, so the building really represents an image of transparency and openness to the citizens it serves. And we really hope that inspires many other projects to meet this rigorous criteria for sustainability, resiliency, beauty, and, and also equity. Uh, great. So as a uh... Do you want to end the slide so you go back to looking at you? Perfect. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, interesting that uh, you talked about the LBC, the certification. Like it's certification I'm aware of, but I don't think it's been adopted hugely, um, especially over here, maybe less so. Um, can you just tell me the, very quickly, just explain exactly what it is uh, to our uh, audience and then then given that it sounds like it's a broadly positive thing, uh, why why you think it's not been adopted more or when, what needs to happen to get it to be adopted more? Three questions there in one. <laughs> great, great, no, that's all, all great questions. So I would say it's um, lead or Brianne on steroids. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, it's intense. It's, it's a deep dive. Um, okay. But it's, um, I think it's really about unpeeling so much of what we've done to the built environment in the last 60 or 70 years and really really going back um, to using passive measures, to using healthy materials and to instead of you know um, forcing nature into submission, really embracing nature as part of the project. Um, so it's it's you know, it's not for for the weak at heart. It's it's a it's a challenge, it's a commitment. Um, you know some of the Can other things quick, you... quickly say how it goes further than lead and and preem which are kind of global sustainability certifications for anyone who isn't uh, sure. aware yeah so you have to uh, along with the equity focus things i touched on you also have to have it be net positive energy and net positive water and then I'm, i did mention the materials red list that's that's mm -hmm. intense so um the thing that's beautiful about the living building challenge is you actually need to show an entire year's worth of utility bills showing zero or, or, or pot. It, there's, you know, they keep updating, 
upping the uh, the game. So it used <laughs> to be net, net net zero. So this project is meeting net zero, but now new projects need to be even net positive. So generating more energy and providing more water than what's being consumed by the by the project. Um, so in Southern California, where it only rains here three months out of the year, actually water was extremely uh, challenging piece of this project. And our team worked, they just poured their heart and soul into it, you know, going through the permitting process and making the authorities having jurisdiction feel comfortable with the building systems that we were proposing on the project was even more than the, the design and engineering of the project. So just some quick examples. It's the first rainwater to potable system in the state of California. So when you go in and drink the water, you're drinking the rainwater, which I think is just just so incredible. And it also has composting toilets, which is basically a foam flush. So that's all um, treated in the basement of the building. But again, like I said, I, you know, our hope is um, this is one of the lar larger living building challenge buildings at 50,000 square feet that it will really inspire um, other projects. Uh, I think for some clients, it's, it's hard to be the first one out of the gate. Um, mm -hmm. So to have other projects to look to and to learn from is is extremely valuable. And it's so interesting kind of... you mentioned uh, water sanitation. Was there a divide between uh, lower and higher income residents in terms of access to those type of services and the nature of services? So this is an office building in, a, in the permit center. So it's basically all of the city services are going to be in this building. So the public will really only be engaged with the permit center piece of it. Um, so there will be public restrooms available, but Hopefully other people will come into the building too, just to check it out <laughs> and use the restrooms. Um, so you, but honestly, you, 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 you would probably walk in and not even realize it was anything special or unique. So you're broadly saying that you, you hope it kind of breaks down barriers that kind of can be used so other other people if they're building a library or et cetera, can, you can point to it and say, look, this works, we can do it. Like people should be designing to this. It's not an unreasonably high benchmark. This is totally doable and something we should be doing. Yes. And, you know, the city of Santa Monica really expects high sustainability goals from anyone who's working and developing in Santa Monica. So I think they felt like it was really important for them to lead the way and show that they were extremely committed to this level of sustainability. Great. That's a, a bit of a le lesson for me. So glad I learned that. Um, moving on uh, next, uh, Pretty, do you want to uh, introduce yourself again, explain what it is you do, and then give us your presentation? Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Preeti Parikh. I'm an associate professor in University College London, Bartlett, and I head the Engineering for International Development Centre. So what we do in our centre is we look at how to improve the environment, living conditions, and provide infrastructure to very marginalised populations who would be based in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and South Asia. I will just share my screen so I can provide a bit more context to that. So I wanted to start by focusing on our cities and how formality and informality coexist in our cities. And um, on average, uh, we know that there are probably between 900 million and 1.6 billion residents who would live in those type of conditions. And whilst I say formality and informality coexist in cities, there is a divide between who has access to say safe public spaces, who has access to housing, infrastructure, clean environments and health infrastructure. And in particular, residents who live in informal settlements, they have this uh, compound effect of struggling with lack of access to infrastructure services like water sanitation, poor management of solid liquid waste, but they uh, mostly reside near natural drainage paths and water bodies because they need to source water. But that means they are much more vulnerable to climate change. So if you think about the compounded effect, it means that they are extremely vulnerable uh, on top of the existing challenges they face. And I'm just going to throw some high level stats at you once again. So 2.2 billion people on this planet do not have access to safely managed drinking water. Nearly 4 billion people do not have access to safely managed sanitation. And 3 billion people lack access to basic hand washing facilities. And then on top of that, we know that around 3 billion people have been affected by flood risk. 
And most of them live in those type of settings. And if you think about the use of public spaces as an interface for providing infrastructure, I mean, one example which comes to mind as a classic is public toilets. But often public toilets are very poorly designed in resource shallow settings. And in effect, this is a public toilet which poses an additional environmental and health risk. But in particular, I feel sorry for women and girls who have to access those facilities on a daily basis just to have access to sanitation, which is a very basic human need. And often women and girls suffer from some form of harassment or violence when they use those facilities. And there's a clear lack of dignity, pride and respect here. But it's not just about uh, accessing public toilets, but generally when we think about public spaces, uh, in UK, over 70% of women say they've suffered some form of sexual harassment when they've accessed public spaces. And this is not just a problem confined to Asia or to UK. This is a global issue where in some cities, nine out of 10 women say that they are scared in terms of accessing public spaces in some form or shape, and they have to adapt or modify their behaviors when they try and access those spaces. And what this means is we're excluding 50% of the population from the mix. Inclusive public spaces can be challenging, can be complicated, and they can be chaotic as well. And I've seen that in my work in slums, where after providing infrastructure, residents took it upon themselves to upgrade their housing stock. The provision of infrastructure and cleaning up the environment also generated a new social networks and economic activity. In fact, my work demonstrates it generated a multiplier of 20 times the original investment in infrastructure. But therefore, I make a case that infrastructure is an enabler for just and equitable spaces. And I also believe in diversity and respecting diversity in public spaces. Um, there is no reason why a mud hut cannot coexist in peace and harmony with a reinforced concrete building, a totally different typology with different forms of landscaping and ways of expressing oneself. But if we want to kind of foster this type of um, co-developed, co-designed public spaces, we need to put community at the heart and center stage of those decision-making processes. And for me, social values is about meeting needs and aspirations of our local communities. And they will vary depending on the context that we face. And the pandemic COVID has exposed those existing vulnerabilities and further enhanced them. I believe that as we move forward in the post COVID world, I'm hopeful there will be a post COVID world and a world where we recover. What I believe is that we will need to work towards those equitable public spaces. We will need to work towards improving living conditions for those who are marginalized. And that will enable us not just only to recover from the pandemic, but to tackle climate change and improve health and well-being for all. And community needs to be at the center stage of this process. So this is an invitation, as I conclude, for built environment professionals to embrace principles of inclusion and diversity in their design processes and planning. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Uh, a, lot, a lot of stats there. I, I, don't know, I don't know if I caught them all, but did you say 2.2 billion people without access to sanitation? Is that uh, Nearly four, um, 4 billion people who do not have access to safe sanitation. So they do have access to some form of sanitation, but yeah. it's not necessarily safe. Sorry for throwing the stats. I'm an engineer, by the way. No, no, no. It's a, like, it's a, that's a, I mean, big, big, big numbers. I think it's a, okay, so half, half the world's population. The more than half of the world's population. More than half of the world's population. And this is important when it comes to COVID because uh, there's a huge public health messaging around we need to wash hands, we need to keep ourselves clean and hygienic. But how can you do it if you do not have access to clean water and if you do not have access to decent toilets and if you do not have access to clean public spaces? I mean, people people struggle when they do. So if you don't, that's, that's going to be very, very tough. And with, with that number is obviously huge and I imagine is growing as the populations of, of South Asia, Africa, uh, areas you talked about are growing as well. And will that be, I assume climate change is going to make that worse or kind of impact those communities more. So there's some level of urgency about, about uh, what needs to be done. Um, so how, I mean, do you have any kind of level of positivity about the fact that change will be able to happen or, and how do you think that will um, manifest itself? 
So I'm going to bring the pandemic back in because one of the worries I have, I'm going to start from the negative stories, Tom. Uh, okay. One of the worry I have is with a lot of resources being allocated, directed to tackling the pandemic as it should be and to vaccination and recovery, would that detract investment and resources for improving the built environment, improving housing, infrastructure and public spaces? But then equally, my argument is that if we want to um, tackle COVID, if we want to green recovery pathway, we will have to invest in infrastructure. We will have to invest in those public spaces. And I sense that there is that resonance or acknowledgement globally with policymakers that we do have to take action for climate change, which is urgent. We do have to invest in health and well-being, which is more sustained and which is not just a knee-jerk reaction. So I am cautiously optimistic and positive that there will be investments in the right direction and there will be resource allocation um, and policies uh, which uh, will help us to recover from COVID, but also address some of those gaps and inequities we have. Yeah, so cautious, cautiously optimistic that, that potentially, if the right moves are made, then things could move in a, a positive direction. Okay, um, and then next on to Anna. Um, well, I'd, I'd like quick? to, yes, I'd like to ask uh, Pretty. I mean, and also Heidi, I mean, given, given the fact that we're re-envisioning uh, all of our infrastructure in light of the shutdown and the emptying of spaces. And, and don't you think that this is the time that we can really push for some sort of radical transformation of infrastructure? Um, and I would think pretty that there would be a greater emphasis on sanitation uh, given a concern with, um, with viruses and, and transmission. I, I mean, one would hope that these health concerns would take um, precedence. Um, the second thing I wanted to ask really to both of you, and maybe we can table this at the discussion, but um, you know, from my experience, there is a lot of desire on the part of professionals in the built environment to have um, community-led processes of participatory design, but there really isn't the mechanism or, or rather we're still developing uh, really good tools um, that can act as an interface between sort of these, you know, the, the, the larger industry and, um, and the ground up. So maybe that's something that we can talk about. Um, I'll touch upon it in, in my presentation as well. I've, I've, made, I've made a note, so we'll, we'll head back to that at the end. Kind of the, kind of the, the disconnect, I suppose, between the people working in the built environment and the communities they're designed for and, that, and kind of what needs to be done to kind of bridge that gap. I think is what you're saying. But anyway, so very quickly, just reintroduce yourself and then um, give us your presentation. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to this discussion, Dzeen and Vero Hapold. Um, my name is Dr. Anna Marasuela Kim. And I guess in this context, I would say I am an intellectual who is interested in ideas and concepts, but one with a deep appreciation for practice and practitioners. And I try to live between those worlds as much as possible um, to build bridges of understanding across them and reach broader publics and diverse audiences. So I am a thinker, a writer, an advisor, an activist uh, who works broadly at the intersection of culture, urban futures, aesthetics, and civic thriving. And I will share now um, my presentation. For most of my career, I've been a member of um, institutes of advanced study, uh, primarily in the US, but also in the UK and in Berlin, and um, have recently stepped out of the ivory tower of academic think tanks to consult to industry, working with Foster and Partners in London, where I became familiar with some of Bureau Hapold's work. Okay, so can you see that all right? Yep. Okay. Uh, so these, these are sort of the three uh, worlds that I'm living in, and I'm going to give an overview of sort of the foundations of some of my thinking and projects uh, in the past with the Thriving Cities project, which was a US-based um, research um, experiment. Uh, currently as advisor to um, an ambitious uh, collective of designers called the Center for Conscious Design, and then some future project work with uh, the newly launched Center for Creative um, Arts, Cultures, and Engagement. 
So first of all, though, I'd like to uh, preface this overview of my work uh, by asking the question, um, what do we mean when we talk about um, equitable space in the first place? Uh, because it's not altogether clear. And for me, this is a productive starting point. Um, this is an image that might spring to mind as an equitable division of space. And I think it's instructive because I think it illustrates um, what we're not aspiring to create. Um, and as an historian, I think, uh, Tom, you also joined me in this week. This could be the beginning of a reflection of a long history of attempts to design equitable spaces um, because this is not the first time we've attempted it. Um, so we might want to think about why this time um, we, we're doing it differently. Let's see, sorry. Next slide. Okay. And I and you know, picking up on Heidi's point and from a philosophical point of view, I think there is an unspoken but underlying premise of this subject that brings us together. And I think it's important to bring it to the surface and articulate it as it brings a sense of urgency in making a case for equitable spaces. And that is a concern with equity and fairness in society at large of who gets to take up those spaces, who gets to be visible and have agency uh, to voice conditions of radical inequality. Uh, that is the legacy of an unequal share in the goods of society, uh, including spatial goods, uh, not just shelter, but also access uh, to the public sphere. And, and by that, we might also include uh, the digital realm. And then thirdly, um, we should acknowledge the radical shift in our perception of space itself um, that makes its equitable division doubly challenging. Um, the climate emergency has forever changed our sense of space, I think it's fair to say, uh, from one of expansion to contraction as we envision land masses and spaces of human habitation eroded by rising sea levels or made uninhabitable by extreme climactic conditions, uh, which will no doubt uh, further exacerbate the structural inequalities that we are attempting uh, to address. So that's quite a, that's quite a few challenges here, but, um, but I, think, um, I think it's important to state from the outcome because I do think they give a sense of to urgency to this, to this project and um, make it distinctive in our time in, in history. So my work uh, began about a decade ago when a group of us at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia began thinking about how we might uh, articulate, capture, and build tools to advance a richer conception of human thriving in the city uh, beyond an economic model or measures. And many things came out of this five-year experiment between research and practice, but I think most valuable was the creation of a new framework based upon uh, human ecology um, of intersecting goods or values that place them in dynamic relation. And this was very much influenced by uh, Jane Jacobs' idea of the city as a problem of organized complexity, uh, along with Aristotelian ideas of flourishing um, in terms of human capabilities theory. And so while it was very much sort of a sociological or humanistic uh, project, I think it was prescient um, in this ecological paradigm and framing and also its, its focus on human flourishing or thriving. And in fact, um, Bureau Happold uh, presented um, sort of a kind of a tool or an index or evaluation of human flourishing last year at um, our Conscious Cities Festival, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, a, lot of, a lot of interesting things came out of this project, but um, the three sort of foundational principles um, are ones that sort of stayed with me and that is um, valuing uh, people uh, human-centered design uh, before economics, um, the sharing of all types of, of knowledge and understanding, particularly from um, peoples whose perspectives have been suppressed or, or, or not voiced, 
and uh, third, um, inequity and addressing equi inequities um, at the very start of the process and disrupting, um, if, if needed, um, existing processes. So, I mean, we're going to talk about the challenges to all of that. But when I moved to London and that work in the US came to a stop, I had the chance to think about how to scale that up. And I've done that to a certain extent by joining forces uh, with, a, as I said, a very ambitious and, and large um, international grassroots think tank, uh, which is a collective convening talent and dialogue and projects across um, many more fields than we had at the Institute from neuroscience to architecture to experts on participatory design. And here I'll just show a, a video that explains what it is we do. Okay, there we go. Um, so now what was an originally sort of this ecological approach to designing in the city has become through this collective of nearly 200 fellows around the world and 17 city chapters globally, um, a much more complex um, and expansive framework. And I think this brings me to my first point about designing equitable spaces um, that equity is not something to be thought of in and of itself, um, but rather once again, in dynamic relationship to many other values and actually as a process itself. <clears throat> in other words, not just an objective, but rather something subjective arising from the conditions of inclusive uh, practice as, um, as, as Priti said, in effect. And sometimes to effect this inclusion uh, in public spaces to feel safe, as she said, um, as a young person or a young woman, um, which is the necessary precondition of equity in, in spaces, uh, sometimes takes a very great force of, uh, of policy or, or an event, I would suggest, to break down the barriers for the people we want to invite, invite in and welcome into these spaces. And so for my next project, um, which is um, still in search of funding, um, a team examines the role that arts and culture can play in this regard, um, with regard to, to equity and spatial equity in disrupting ordinary conventions around public space to reclaim them uh, for a greater diversity of urban inhabitants. And this is the subject of the uh, new collaborative research uh, project between uh, a team at the center and Artichoke, which is one of the UK's most important producers of public art events, um, who have created some of the most celebrated outdoor art in recent times, including the Lumiere Light Festivals, 
and the Sultan's Elephant, which you see. Um, this groundbreaking work was staged by Royal Deluxe. Um, it took place over four days in London. It required shutting down the entire center of it, if you can imagine, which was a massive, a massive effort uh, that took um, the director, Helen Marriage, uh, seven years to achieve. And this took place in 2006 after terrorist bombings in London, which gives it a resonance uh, to our current post-pandemic time as a reminder of the importance of cultural gatherings as a means to reanimate the city and civic connection and, and envision the possibility of uh, a shared urban life together. So I just want to show uh, very quickly just one minute of um, this fantastic um, event here in which a young girl arrives from outer space. <laughs> search of an elephant. event. I'm glad to talk about it more. And so um, just, to, just to say finally, um, I'm very excited about the way that um, these new initiatives intersect for me. And as I reflect upon um, my approach to these questions um, going on into this next decade, I think um, more dedication uh, to the power of collectives and collaboration, and also fostering the conditions of civic agency, particularly for young people in this next generation uh, who live in the shadow of the climate emergency, who live in the, um, climate, the shadow of COVID and many other challenges. Um, and in our Conscious Cities Festival this year for the center is, um, being hosted by uh, Bengaluru. And I would just end by showing a clip from the ways that they imagine uh, gaining their own agency uh, in city. Thank you. 
So, um, uh, as as uh, as you anticipated, I was intrigued by your your early slide, um, and I think you were saying that people have attempted to design kind of equitable spaces or equitable cities before, and um, they haven't ended up being what we would consider equitable. Maybe do you want to quickly explain what you meant by that? It's kind of why do you think pr previous attempts at designing equitable cities have failed? Kind of historical attempts. <laughs> well, that's a that's a that's a big question. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I think that would be a completely different presentation. But um, I think that um, I mean, I would really like to focus on what are the challenges today. Um, I think w one of the one of the things that, especially um, coming down to London, but even before um, that, I worked on is the problem of, of gentrification and um, where a city would seem to be thriving economically, right, by all measures um, succeeding, um, but we aren't able to capture the loss that occurs um, with, this, with this kind of uh, displacement and flattening of the richness um, of the diversity of communities. So so, you know, I've, I've tried to work on, you know, sort of very specific um, problems um, to provide new paradigms and, and tools to address them. And one of those was to think about, um, as I said, um, the city in terms of this um, dynamic uh, ecology or system. And, and, you know, maybe that is the start. The systems thinking is, is a start to a discussion about um, how difficult it is to change. Um, you know, a system like um, uh, like capitalism, like uh, globalization, um, and you know, we haven't talked about policy yet. But you know, on the one hand, you have these really you know large structures, um, and then you have these grassroots mo mo movements, or or what we would hope would be you know the ground for bottom up participatory design. And I think what I think is, is, is really important and I, and I work at more and more is trying to find those bridges between, you know, these very, these very large sort of bureaucratic or inflexible structures or systems and, and these sort of, um, you know, bottom up organic uh, participatory uh, processes. And I think you know, Bureau Happold, uh, other organizations, we, they, they have developed tools, you know, participatory mapping and, and so forth. But, you know, having just been on a, a academic panel for the Thamesmead regeneration here in London, for instance, with Arab, you know, I, 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 I'm disappointed at, at what I see still, um, you know, that we're still not able to capture and fully involve the communities uh, who, who's, you know, where we're, we're creating these huge developments that are going to completely change their lives. So I think, uh, you know. I, I suppose what I was kind of um, broadly getting at is I imagine that in the past and probably today that uh, people trying to design equitable spaces may have failed because it's kind of uh, the person who's de defining what an equitable space is has a lot of power in that conversation. So in the past, the image of terrace yes. housing, I assume like worker housing, probably that was equitable space defined by a developer or a landowner. Um, yeah, so this kind of brings me to a question which I think is relevant to all of you, kind of how do, how do we define and how do you define what equitable space is and how do you make sure that the spaces are equitable rather than i mean everyone has bias so it's it's an extremely tough task i would imagine anyone feel free to jump in and take that i'll, I'll jump in tom and just building off of your last question too i mean you know when you look through history and you look at who's in power who has the money and is making these decisions right it's a pretty small group of people that probably look pretty similar and have their agendas, right? So I think, um, you know, as Anna was just talking, we really need to bring everyone's voice to the table to, to achieve that equity, to, to, to achieve that diverse thinking. And, you know, I think there's so many studies out there that when you bring a diverse team to the table, the outcomes are, are always better. It's always more creative, it's more inclusive. It's, it's 
always better. So I think we just really need to shift the power dynamic and the decision makers and to make it such more inclusive um, process and decision making. And, um, you know, governance came up quite a bit on the LA County plan. I think here in the US, I'm sh- I imagine around the world, there's just, there, there can be a trust issue between communities and, and the politicians, which isn't really unfortunate because the politicians are meant to be there to, um, <laughs> to serve the people. Um, so, so one of the, the 12 goals that we did come up with for the county plan was, um, I'll just read it here. It's inclusive, transparent, and accountable governance that facilitates participation in sustainability efforts, especially by um, disempowered communities. So that, you know, there's lots of actions and targets and that sit within that goal, but that was definitely a major um, aspect that, that we needed to, to tackle um, just for, for transparency and, and, and raising those voices. And I agree, I agree with Heidi, and I wanted to build on this point and add bias to the discussion as well, because as uh, architects, urban planners, engineers, we do not necessarily live in the settings that we operate in and we intend to improve. So sometimes it's really difficult to put ourselves in say, the shoes of a woman who has to wake up at five in the morning and go and access a very shorty public toilet. And how does it feel and what the barriers are? And also there are biases within the solutions because why would you think of uh, building a box in a public space, which is not private as a public toilet when we know that there are other solutions so I think somehow there is a bias in the design process where sometimes we feel that if we are designing for a low income resident, the solution needs to be different, it needs to be a makeshift solution, perhaps less permanent solution. Uh, perhaps it is okay to have a solution which is different from higher income residents. But my argument is that actually, if we are designing in those settings, the solution needs to be better. It needs to be a high quality solution. It needs to be a smart solution uh, because that's where people need uh, help from the built environment professionals the most. Okay, so so the, the, the argument is that kind of the need is greater, therefore the solution needs to be better, um, which is- and, just, and we need to be smarter. Yes, which, which makes a lot of sense. Um, I assume that the a public toilets in in a, an area where lots of people are using it is going to be, well, for one, used a lot more. It's going to need to work a lot harder and need to make be better for a lot more people. Okay, that makes sense. And the 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 other thing that kind of all of your talks touched upon, as well as community led, is kind of human centric design. And one of the questions I said I was going to ask you all at the beginning was kind of why have we got so far in in the world not being designing for humans? Um, you all kind of suggest that we need to start designing for humans and with human centered design but what on earth are we doing already and why aren't we doing that yet um yeah again anyone feel to jump feel free to jump in <laughs> i think that's a great question tom and i ask myself that all the time um but um you know anna said in her presentation we need to value people before economics okay. um so again i think in in our project work there's a very small group of people who are informing the design and the engineering, the process and making the decisions. And it's just so critical that we put, pull together more diverse teams and, and just pull in as many voices as possible and really understand who is being impacted by our projects and, and just embed that in the, in the process. Um, it's not typically how we've done things, but I think it's, it's, it's really how we need to move forward. And also to, you know, the economics piece, right? It's, it's so much looking at that first cost. But if we really look much more holistically and more of a, you know, triple bottom line process where you're looking at people, planet and profit and looking at the long term, right? I mean, many of our buildings, um, I mean, here in the US, obviously you've, you've got buildings that are much older than we have here in LA, but, um, you know, maybe a typical um, length of building is, you know, a hundred years. So really looking at the impact of the people who are going to be engaging with that building over the hundred year lifespan will really kind of shift how, how you might make decisions. Okay. Heidi, and uh, I was thinking, reflecting on the definition of engineering as it was many years ago, which was about harnessing natural resources uh, for the benefit of mankind. Uh, the narrative has clearly shifted from that. Uh, that's no longer the narrative. But clearly, there, that indicated a dominance that we had over nature, natural resources, and their environment. 
uh, in a way which probably has led to the climate crisis that we face. But when we think about equity in design and planning processes, we do design for human beings. Uh, the problem is we do not design for all human beings. Yeah. And that's due to the fact that there are few who are in the position of power, who have the voice, who have the financial resources, who then design uh, for things which are comfortable for them or people who are similar to them. And I think that's where the narrative needs to shift. And I, I assume the narrative shifts by um, involving the communities. That's involving the, the communities design. and diverse stakeholders um, as well. So thinking about who has a seat at the table, who has access to those resources and what they can do to leverage those resources. Uh, which I assume is that, and that's kind of what you were uh, talking about uh, within your presentation kind of that building that bridge between the people design designing cities the architects engineers who by their nature are going to be educated or well-educated people if they're an architect or an engineer and the stakeholders the governments etc and the people they're designing for so is that how 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 do we build that bridge i suppose anna for you first that question <laughs> what kind of steps need to be taken right well and you also asked the question about, you know, how do community-based practices then get scaled up? You know, we have these projects, but then how do we have a global effect? And I guess, you know, for me, the two go together because, and, and this is why I, I have sort of turned to um, this idea of collectives and collective intelligence, uh, because it what it does is it brings together expertise, but that, that is also very, culturally and community-based across cities and cities then learn from each other. Um, so you're, what you're doing is you're, you're leveraging, you know, sort of local expertise. So it is very community-based, but then you're creating a global movement. Um, in this case, um, a more conscious um, approach to design, which is um, empathic and, and equitable. So for me, that's that's the way going forward. Um, you know, I've worked with uh, research groups. I work with in community activism. I've worked with industry, but more and more, I think um, the future is in the power of uh, collective intelligence and 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 really leveraging you know resources across across um, globe. I think we're in a really interesting moment. You, you said, you know, why don't we design for humans? We're kind of in the post-human design, Tom. I think we really, I mean, there, there, there has been a moment, a big shift, and I, uh, Heidi can attest to this, which really came out of workplace, um, which investigated, you know, the relationship between well-being and productivity. You know, so, so this is always within the frame of capitalism but it produced a real emphasis on designing for, for health and well-being. Um, but now we're, 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 we're moving, I think, into, as Heidi um, and Priti both say, you know, it, it, we're, we're moving into this, this larger uh, climactic, um, um, you know, post-human, post I would say, you know, Anthropocene and thinking about uh, larger forces. We haven't talked about species, but you know, there's a big emphasis on wilding, for instance, um, and really uh, decentering the human in our considerations. So I think that's, um, that's interesting as well. So both listen to communities and decenter the humans. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a bit of a paradox. And if you, you know, I, I, was, I was reading Bruno Latour about this, you know, that that um, yes, we we need to find a way to come back to to, to Earth, right, um, and to deal with this with these with this paradox that um, you know we're in this sort of global moment, but we we can't um, we have a different perspective on it. So so yeah, we we're both we 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 need human agency, but we need to decenter. The yeah, I mean, it's 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 obviously a complex task. Both can happily coexist. I think, um, Heidi, you look like you're about to say something. I may. I was just just thinking about just building, you know, policies and regulations and codes and how important those are, right, Pretty, and just just kind of creating a global standard by by creating building codes. You're creating the floor, right? That's basically the minimum <laughs> design you have and you have to do to have it be a legal building so if we can really raise that and have that 
um, really, you know, like I was saying earlier, right? Everything's so interlinked, climate change, anything we can do um, to make improve air quality and get off fossil fuels is gonna have fantastic health outcomes for the people who are impacted by, by the drilling or the emissions, et cetera. So um, anything we can do to advocate, to raise that floor of, of, of our building codes will have enormous impacts. Um, and, and Priti, I'd actually love to hear from, you know, what some of the, the wealthier countries can do to really um, to, to help those countries with, with less resources and, and, and provide really good templates or examples or codes to, to borrow from. Or what can we yeah. learn, learn from so many of the, the countries you were talking about? I guess codes are tricky uh, because if we take codes that are relevant for cities and if we try and apply to very high density settings of slums where you've got very small footpaths and roads, those, uh, those codes do not work in the form they are. So in a way, it means we need to reshape, reshape and reconfigure codes to make it work for the setting. But there's an added complexity of scaling up this process because with community driven processes, you have, uh, you have this long period of building trust and engagement and participation on one hand, but you then need say the engineers, you need uh, architects to go and design houses to design pipes for sewers and do some of those design processes as well. And I think, my belief is uh, coming from an academic perspective that there needs to be a shift in education, there needs to be a shift in curriculum for engineers, architects and planners to enable them and to equip them with tools which will uh, enable them to challenge conventional standards and guidelines and practices and which will enable them to better engage with the communities uh, to help them with those technical aspects which the communities cannot do by themselves. So that's why I think scaling up is so tough and it's so complicated and hard. And it's not as, even though it sounds easy, we know how to build toilets, we know how to build houses, but that's why I think it's not happening at the pace we want it to happen. But because it, it, there's not, it's basically not one size fits all, is that the, the so the, the each solution needs to be appropriate for the, for the, the setting. Therefore yeah. scaling up needs to, you can't just, repeat you need to talk to every community to find out their needs okay uh, this uh we've all been well seems to be a lot of talk about community involvement community engagement uh, this is uh it's it's one of those terms that seems to be on every development now kind of a community-led or community engagement it's um like a bit like greenwashing community washing seems to be in every development so how do we encourage this to, this to, the, to make it, sorry, how do we encourage community engagement to be done properly? I suppose, um, yeah, rather than just uh, have a meeting, tick some boxes, right? We consult with the community and then build a tower block uh, or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, any any thoughts? Well, I'll I'll just say, having been involved in in these um, discussions, that you need you need good tools and you need good processes. And, um, you know, I think we all agree, and I, and I tried to say that, you know, equitable design is about inclusive processes. So you need, as I said, you need these, the, you need these tools to, to bridge the gap, to build trust. And often, you know, the successful things that I have seen is when, for instance, in the councils in the city of London, they already have existing groups that have trust in the community that can bring those voices forward and they mediate, they act as a liaison. Um, it's about, you know, the, it's about those intermediaries in my mind. I, I suppose the, the, the issue is though that, um, yeah, it, it's very hard to define what is community involvement, I suppose. And it, it's, it's very, it seems to me that maybe in London, maybe the UK, that every project basically will say that they have consulted with the community and to dividing the ones that are just saying it and dividing the ones that have actually made meaningful, um, well, where the community has had a meaningful uh, contribution, where the designers and architects have cared what they say, I suppose, <laughs> it is tough. So how, how do you incentivize it? How do you make it so that's that's it's real basically it's probably for heidi <laughs> i suppose that question 
Um, I, you know, there's, um, <clears throat> as with kind of early years of sustainability, right? As you said, there was the greenwashing. Um, so having these third party tools are so helpful and there's a, a lot coming up more in the equitable process um, space. And it, honestly, I think using those tools just gives it a lot of rigor, it gives it structure, gets everybody on the same page. Um, and it's a process that can, you know, I mean, to answer your earlier question, I think, you know, having uh, developers, higher education folks, whoever is gonna be building a project engage even before the brief is set all the way through the design process, especially when key decisions are being made, but then also to staying engaged with that community and then really understanding the impacts of that project on the broader community. Um, I think once we do more and more of this, Tom, and get it more embedded in our process and the tools really develop, um, we'll just all have the right language to use and the right resources um, in our toolkits and, and have some really great impact. I agree with Anna. Positive take. <laughs> oh, sorry, Pretty, go for it. Sorry, and I was just about to say, I agree with Anna and Heidi, the need for tools and uh, very practical guidelines uh, to work closely with communities to co-develop um, projects and interventions. And I think this needs to be embedded in education from the outset so that we kind of create this new generation of professionals or policymakers with the hope that some of them will go into policy, will have this position of influence, who will embed those tools in their processes. And an interesting example comes to mind from South Africa, uh, where a government official uh, visited a community, they discussed a community garden project, they provided a plot of land, they provided seeds, and six months later, no one was watering the plants. And they said, look, we've consulted the community, this is a participatory process, and why um, is the garden not flourishing? So it's a bit like that everyone thinks uh, that they are engaging in a participatory process, but whether it's really participatory or not, it's a different story. And sometimes it's about digging into motivations and needs and aspirations as to why would people want a garden, who would want to maintain the garden, because we can install the housing, we can install infrastructure, but who operates and maintains it is an important question as well. Okay, but that's a just a little bit over time, but we've got some questions online. So I'm going to quickly uh, run through those. Um, first one directly relates to what you were saying then, Pretty, is from, uh, from Andrew Mole, uh, who asks, so should we concentrate on making who is well-educated diverse? I assume the idea being that, that if you make the decision makers, the architects, the engineers, a diverse community, then this will better reflect um, everything that's kind of not solves the problem but is maybe the first step um, yes you... i think so i think that there needs to be this trickle up rather than trickle down uh effect where we need uh diverse groups to be represented need to need them to be at the table and need them to be in a position of power uh, because especially when we think about gender inclusion in cities for example it almost feels that it's 50% uh, of the city or residents in the city are invisible and somehow spaces are not designed for those 50%. So I think having a voice at the table will make a big difference. Yeah. Hey, either the other, either Anna Heidi want to add anything or is that just all, all agree that a more diverse uh, community of people uh, building our cities, making decisions is better for the city? Seems. <laughs> Absolutely agree. We've done some just studies and metrics of our um, our gender and our ethnic diversity within Bureau Hampold, um, and you know, seen some success, but also seen some areas where we can improve. And on pouncing that data, um, we are actually doing better than better than the state census data. However, we realized that in the city of Los Angeles, especially, our staff was really not representative of the local community. So it was hugely inspiring to see that that data and our staff got hugely involved in mentoring programs. So we've got about 40% of our staff who are in mentoring programs, mentoring middle school and high school students. So they're even aware of our industry and get them excited about it. So we, we just realized we need um, more diversity in in education and uh, so that we can even hire those candidates and have them working on our projects. So hopefully that's had a really positive impact and we'll continue to do that. Yeah, and, I, and, and I know that also Pretty is involved in mentoring and I want to say that that is a large part of being 
you know, a part of a global collective is, is that aspect as well. Um, reaching out, you know, from London to Bengaluru to um, Latin America. And, and it's, 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 it's really what needs to change. Okay, and a uh, slight change of tact here, but uh, talking about community-led and community engagement, um, we've got a question from uh, Paula Gallo, or Gallo, probably, um, asking, are any of you actually working with children, and how do you go about getting their, in their involvement on the spaces that are designed? Obviously, it's a, a, um, a, a community that hasn't really got their, a, a say, a voice uh, as such. Well, there's a growing interest, and I think there is a new book published by the RIBA on, you know, designing the city as if you were a child and how that could resolve many of our problems if we did. And one of the thing, one of one of the areas that we work on, one of the domains uh, at the Center for Conscious Design is playful learning um, and, you know, designing uh, landscapes that encourage curiosity. Um, there is a project in uh, Philadelphia that um, reconceived this pathway, you know, through a derelict er area on the way to school um, as an area of playful learning. So I think, you know, there's a great deal of interest in, in those topics. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, but how, how do you actually go about getting, getting a true idea? Because it sounds like it's a quite good test case on how you engage a community that one is hard to engage with but also two probably doesn't know exactly what they need and want <laughs> so uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean it, it is a bit top down but the but let's say we get down on the ground to see from the child view and I yeah. think that you know in a sense if, if you can create an area where children can thrive then then adults can too let's put it that way if we were to put, if we were to clothe all the children and feed them and create conditions where children could thrive, then everyone else could, could manage as well. So I think that's, that's one of the perspectives. I've been involved in a couple of projects. Um, one is in India where I was working with colleagues in health to see how we can improve nutrition for infants and babies. And what was interesting is, uh, I think typically when we work with adults, we do not think about the fact that babies crawl and hence hand washing is even more important. Uh, housing and floor in housing and play areas need to be clean and hygienic. So I think it was interesting talking to the mothers, just observing children in their play and understanding how as engineers, we could uh, better look at water sanitation services. So I think there is a lot to learn from observing and working um, closely with children and infants and yeah so it's a, it's a good case a good case study good example where like there is a lot to learn by engagement basically and it will make you think of a, a city and a space in a completely different way okay and then i've got a final question which is which is what all of you can answer it's a, a huge one from hassan he says uh, how can we force governments to acknowledge that the only way to save our planet and environment is to follow green codes in architecture and let people understand that going green is a lifestyle. So basically, I think that's broadly kind of how do you get governments to engage to make sure that we don't destroy the planet even more? <laughs> so um, so uh, pretty. I'm looking at you. So do you want to take that one first? Kind of. Sure. I mean, this is a tough question, a question which I grapple with myself, because within me, there's a bit of tension of recognizing that you need to provide access to energy to everyone, you need to provide access to water sanitation, and there are huge gaps in services. And then there is this desire and need uh, to do it in a way which is green, uh, which is resilient, which is sustainable. And I find that there are times when governments, especially in low middle income countries, face this challenge of whether we go for the solution which is the cheapest, the solution which is the easiest, the solution that is better known, has guidelines, versus trying out these new solutions and leapfrogging. Having said that, in the renewable sector, in renewable energy, there are examples of communities where uh, I work with communities in Africa who've never used electricity in their lives before. And thanks to private sector involvement, they are leapfrogging to using solar technologies. So it is possible, but it requires a bit more creative uh, thinking. 
And I think from, from the U.S. perspective, um, won't get too political, but thank goodness for the <laughs> new administration um, and their focus, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the most diverse administration the U.S. has ever had. They have really committed to working on infrastructure issues here and putting the money where in the communities that need it most. So really having that equity lens. So I think that's extremely exciting. Um, and so I think, you know, countries like the U.S., states like California really um, – Need to need to lead the way, and and hopefully everyone will see the light and and follow along and be inspired by by what we do here. Um, so I think rather than coming at it from um, forcing government to comply, right? It's 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 really leading the way and 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 creating charting a path for others to adopt. And Anna, anything to add just on how I suppose how governments can be encouraged to help with your community or cultural <laughs> or central design, I suppose. Well, Tom, you're here with me in London, right? Yep, I am. Yes, it's been it's been interesting to see how the, you know, at least the at the level of city government, they've seized the opportunity. Uh, the mayor has seized the opportunity uh, brought about by the pandemic to institute, you know, more green measures such as, you know, cycle, now that, you know, traffic is low, instituting more cycle lanes um, and um, really making ambitious targets for greening up the city. So, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not on the side of, of lobbying governments. I mean, I think this is really, this is really difficult. Um, but when it comes to, you know, getting down to what makes a, a city you know, economically viable, a good place to work, um, where corporations want to live. I think that's when, when governments start to, to to listen. So basically, make it make it uh, a good place to live, and then it basically incentivize it by showing that community led design, human centric design, etc., will make the city better for all. Therefore, it's kind of ridiculous not to do it <laughs> I suppose yes, yes. Um, it's an investment and you know we haven't talked much about social value but I think there's a growing understanding that you know and it would seem absurd not to think about the value of social infrastructure but this idea of social value is coming more and more to the forefront I mean the arts have always had to make a case for social impact and social value but now um, now it's coming into design world as, as well. It's, it's interesting to see. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to everyone who's watching. Uh, obviously, thanks to Heidi, Pretty, Anna for, uh, yeah, loads. I learned loads. I hope everyone else did as well. And, uh, yeah, I, I'm very, very happy that all three of you seem to have a relatively positive take. Um, <laughs> so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that all uh, bodes well for all of us. Uh, okay, that's... Um, enough from us, so thanks, bye.